Hi everyone, I'm doing day two of my John Maxwell, The Law of Buy-In, from this book, uh, The 21 Most Powerful Minutes in a Leader's Day. And um, as I do every day, I went for my swim today, I took my walk, I got lots of nice pictures, photographs, and it's fall here in Canada, so the bugs are out. I guess I have to get some insect repellent because I didn't have any on today and I've got little bug bites all over me <laughs> so it's one of those things anyway it's a nice time of the year, year here in Canada because all the leaves start changing colors so I like to go out and see them and I am very fortunate or blessed as they say because we have a park close by so I can see them from my balcony looking onto Young Street and I really like fall. It's a pretty time of the year in this country. So today I'm looking at um, this thought leadership from John Maxwell and it says, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days and that's from Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. So basically what he's talking about in this chapter is having a vision. So it's fine to have a vision. You find that in organizations when the training is done, they'll always tell you, this is our vision, this is our mission, and this is how we want to accomplish it. And you'll find it on the logos, you'll find it on adverts that they run, because they want people to buy into that. They want people to, whether it's an image that speaks to you, at Christmas time for us, it's the image of baby Jesus being born, or whether it's the image of the Good Shepherd, or the image of Jesus cleansing the temple. You're buying into an image of Jesus there. So people who possess a vision are not necessarily the leaders. He says, I've known a lot of would-be leaders who possess vision but lack the ability to get people to buy into them. So people have to buy into us when they hire us, when they invest in us, when they take us on to do a project for them, or they take us on as an employee or a contractor. They have to buy into us. They have to like us, they have to know us, and they have to trust us. And how does it start? It starts at home with the character building. I know for me, when I take the catechism, or I used to take the children's catechism in the church, the children were so good. They always listened, and they were always so sweet. And that's a reflection of the homes that they come from. You find that today, sometimes teachers say the children don't listen, and you land up being like a parent to them instead of just being their teacher, which should not be the case. But it does start in the home, and for us, we have that imagery of Jesus being in the home. There isn't a lot of information other than his birth, where he was born in the stable. But we do know he grew up in a home with a family, and he had a father who was hardworking, a carpenter, and he had a mother. So, again, it's that stability of family that we see there. And so too for us, we come from homes, we come from families, we come from parents who provided for us, parents who gave us food and clothing and shelter and took care of us when we were babies. And that character development starts in the home. And then secondly, it says that key influencers have charisma, so they know how to influence people, they know how to get people to buy into him. And John Maxwell talks about Gideon and Gideon having a strong person to lean on in his father. So that comes to all of us too in our lives. We need somebody to lean on when things are hard, when things are difficult, and when we are hurting, when we're going through hard times. We need to have that person that we can go to, that we can talk to. And for some of us, it is a very difficult journey, but that doesn't mean that we give up. 
for example, for me, since coming into Canada, I haven't had any stability. I haven't had any steady income. I haven't had anything that I can say, okay, I've, I've managed to do this and it's, everything's gone smoothly. But I've had to learn to adjust. I've had to learn to take money from other people because when I left TD, I had a good job. I had a permanent job. I had a stable job. I had all my skills, all my education. So obviously people thought, you know what, she'll get something else, no problem. But that didn't happen for me. And it went on and on and on until 2018 when I got my next uh, long-term position. So that's a very, very long time for somebody to cope with unemployment, to cope with not having an income, not being able to make ends meet. Thankfully, I had my condo to sell, so I could live off the proceeds of that. But today, many people, not just me, are struggling because if you don't have work, how are you going to rent even a room in a house? How are you going to rent that? And how are you going to provide for yourself? So for me, I mind my own business. I don't get involved with other people's lives. I don't say anything about them. I just love my life. I love a quiet life. And I do whatever I have to do to focus on achieving my goals. And I lean on my faith. I lean on my prayer. I lean on what I know has helped me in the past. And my music, I love to listen to my music. And there are certain genres of music that have come out of very difficult periods. So they are written in certain keys that they'll help you to stay positive. They'll help you to be upbeat. They'll help you to build your resilience. And you saw that in sitcoms, you'll see there's certain music that they'll play. And it reflects the times of what was happening during that period. And then the third point, he broadened his circle. So credibility, this is again, he's focusing on Gideon and how he brought in people to his circle. So it was the same with Jesus. He brought people into his circle and he brought in fishermen, tax collectors, People with different skills and different trades that would be part of his ministry journey. And it's the same thing with us in the church. We have trades, we have careers, we have things that we do outside of the church. Not all of us are priests, not all of us are living in the parish. We all have trades, we all have to provide for ourselves, earn our living, and we also help in the church. And that's true of our deacons. It's true of anybody that's a lay person. So we keep that faith value and we take it into our workplaces to help to change things, to help to transform things. And it's not easy. It's never easy. You'll find that you'll just get it to a place where things are working well. And then they'll say, okay, this is working well. Now we can take it away and we can go teach it to somebody else or we can we have to change the system and then we have to start all over again but if the core values are kept then things go smoothly if those core values are not kept then you find that corruption comes in money laundering comes in different things come in that bring the organization down so that's what we try to do, we try to build each other up as a team, motivate each other. Most of the work I've done has been very, very stressful because you can imagine if you're doing a contract and it's only two to six months and then you have unemployment for five months or six months and then you get another short term contract, it's very hard, especially if you've come from a single parent home and you've been responsible for sponsoring your mother, for bringing her here, for helping other people, helping in the parish. And there's even been times where I've gone to food banks and I've asked them, you know, I don't have a job or I'm not earning that well, I'm on minimum wage. Can I sign up? And they, they just say, no, you can't, you don't qualify. 
or they don't bother returning my calls. So it's very, very hard when you come here. And a lot of people decide that, you know what, they don't want to stay. They're going back to India or they're going back to South Africa or wherever they came from. Because if you don't have that safety net, then what are you going to do? Go live on the street or go live with relatives who have their own problems and they looking for support for their own children and their own children's girlfriends and husbands and wives. I mean, it's it's an awful situation to be in. And that's something that I really don't want. I want to stay independent and live in my own space because I don't want to hear about their children and their marital problems and they're looking to get support for them whether it's in the church or whether it's in the parish, it's got nothing to do with me because nobody's helped me and my family get that. I've had to do it on my own. So the Bible does encourage that, that yes, we live in community, but when we need the help, we do it on our own. We go and ask for the help on our own. We approach agencies. We go out walking the streets, looking for jobs. We write to people. Nobody wrote for me to Roger Federer or to Rafa Nadal or to Bono. I did it for me and my family. So the same way other people have to do it for their families. If somebody asks me, can you write to them and ask them, like the Marians, can you write to them and ask them if they can send the house blessing for my daughter? Yes, I do it. But most of the times the Marians will say no. If they want it for their family, then tell them to write to us. Why are they getting you to do it for them? So we also have to be aware of that in our organizations as well. And then the fourth point, when moved, the time and influence were right. So this is coming to the culmination. And you find that in Jesus' travels, when he's finished in one place, when the time is right, he moves on to another place. The same way he did the healing of Peter's mother-in-law in the home, then he takes the healing out and he's healing people in the streets. So we also have to judge that, that time and the place. And the people that are with us in our organizations, they also have to be ready for it. Because if they're not ready for it, we're going to land up not having a team to work together to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. And it's the same in a family. So for me, I'm on my own. My mother has her husband and they are a team. They are a unit. Of course, they help where they can. They visit sometimes, but they have their own nuclear family. So they do what they want and they don't inform me. If they do inform me, it's because they want to inform me but they do what they want, they go where they want, and I do the same. I don't inform people where I'm traveling, where I'm going out. I'm not a child, and other people don't have to inform me. And so then he just uh, gives in here, he says that there's a pattern that we have to follow, and we can model it on the Bible principles, the Bible teaching, and also when we go into new organizations. So when we go into new organizations, normally they tell us, use the first 30 days to just observe. But if you're only there for 30 days, you're not, you can't just sit and observe for 30 days. So it's very different. You have to hit the ground running. You have to ask questions. You have to build the relationships quickly. And I've had contracts like that where they are very, very short. I've been a girl Friday in England, here in Canada. And so it's different. If you're going into a permanent job, yes, the first 30 days you can just observe, see what's happening, and then slowly, slowly build those relationships. But when you're under pressure and you're doing a small contract and they want you to deliver, there's a different skill set that you have to get to buy in. And you have to learn the policies quickly. You have to know who to go to for what. You have to have your systems ready to work. And when you're bringing in contractors as well. 
So there are different skills involved depending on what you're trying to accomplish in the organization. And then he just gives the point, just because a person has vision and occupies a leadership position doesn't necessarily mean that people will follow. Before they get on board, they have to buy in. And the question that he leaves us with for reflection is, is your leadership as compelling as your vision? So we can have a vision of how we want our life to unfold, but there's always setbacks, there's always challenges, there's always things that change in the world, like how we had COVID, and now there's monkeypox. So we don't know whether we're going to go into another lockdown or whether we are going to work in the office. People who are working in offices now are lucky because they are getting to see people, to interact with people, to build those relationships. Because if we do go into another lockdown, they, you need that. You need that team to have already have been built. When you're coming in and people are already working from home, it can be very different. But people adjust and people buy in. So that's the skills and that's the experience we take with us. And the migrant journey is not easy for anybody. It doesn't matter whether you are coming in as a family or you're coming in single. It's harder for the single person actually because you're on your own and you have to cope with everything. But there are lots of uh, resources in Canada. In that way, we are very fortunate because they have employment centers you can go to to get guidance. You can go and talk to people. You can knock on doors. There's mentoring organizations that are set up now, which were not there before. They've made it easier for people to get their credentials for human resources and other fields, which were not there before, which people like me fought for, so that those coming after us can have an easier journey. I don't see the point if that I had to struggle, then the person coming after me should also struggle. I mean, what's the point of life? To make it even harder for them? So it should be easier for each generation that comes up. And so people like me and others who have been on mentoring committees or who have been migrants have helped to put those systems in place in Canada. And that's how it goes. And we also have to stay open because like for me, if things are not working out here, then I have to be open to taking a job outside of Canada, whether it's in America or Australia or Ireland or wherever it is, I have to be open to going because there's no point staying here and I can't even get a job in retail and sending out thousands of applications. And it's not just me. I saw a, an article on the internet of uh, somebody that sent out 2,200 applications and he still doesn't have a job. So it's very, very uh, tough. It's very, uh, very difficult environment. Even with all your skills, your education, your opportunities, just people are having really hard times. And this has been going on since 2008, since the recession. So I don't know how it's going to end, but I do pray and I ask God to help me, to give me that opportunity where I can relocate if needed and in a progressive country. I don't want to be in a country where people are beheaded and all that. I want to be somewhere where I'll be safe and I can be in a progressive country. And it won't be the first time I've started over, so I'll be able to do it if I have to. I've lived in Zimbabwe, I've lived in South Africa, I've lived in England, and I've traveled on my own to quite a few different places through Kontiki tours or day tours. And so I'm, I know how to do it. I know how to navigate. And there are opportunities out there. So hopefully sooner rather than later, one of those will open up for me. You can take those questions away with you and you can use them in your businesses. You can use them on your teams, the principles. And if I can be of help with setting up workshops or help in any way, you're always free to message me or to contact me. 
I'm also a speaker through the HRPA in Toronto, so I'm registered with them as well. And of course, with John Maxwell.